everybody. Welcome back to Unapologetically Woman. This year we're celebrating phenomenal women all across Kentucky who make no apologies for their perspectives or the impacts that they're making in the community. Today we're celebrating Dr. Keiko Tanaka, who is a professor of rural sociology at the University of Kentucky. Keiko is an educator, an author, and an advocate. She is co-chair of the UK Asian and Asian American Affinity Group, Unapologetically Woman, Keiko Tanaka, that's you, welcome. Thank you, Sharon, for inviting me. I'm so glad to be able to celebrate you today. Thank you. So tell us what you do at the University of Kentucky. So I am a rural sociologist, meaning that I study about rural communities, uh, agriculture, food systems, and sometimes environment and the natural resource areas. And I have appointment as a full professor in the Department of Community and Leadership Development in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment. But I also have a joint appointment in the Department of Sociology in the College of Arts and Sciences. That's really exciting. So we're, <laughs> we're going to talk about that art okay. piece. We're going to talk about that. But tell us more about the food systems and agriculture and what, your, what you find out through your research. So the... Um, I, uh, since, ever since I was a graduate student, my interest has been food systems. And the, the reason is my professor one day said, well, you can live without uh, cars, uh, 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 any, any type of uh, uh, houses. Well, no, you cannot live with a house. <laughs> but uh, uh, cars, clothes, and so forth. But you can never live without food. Food is the fundamentally most important item for the human survival. So how the food system is organized has enormous impact upon how uh, our, our lives are shaped. So one of my goal is trying to understand how to create the food system which is sustainable and accessible to all people and then affordable to the people regardless of uh, class, race, gender, ethnicity, and the background. And so one of the uh, research I did with the students in election, and this was in the mid-2000s, so it would be something like 2010, 2012, so forth. We discovered Lexington has enormous inequality in terms of access to affordable grocery store which sells grocery, you know, affordable food items and also the uh, particularly access to the uh, fresh produce and then um, uh, yeah, fresh produce and healthy food. Because some of the neighborhoods that we see in Lexington do not have um, grocery stores in those absolutely. neighborhoods. That's absolutely. And so, so maybe those are, are food deserts. Yes. So what, yes. Do we, what do we do about that? Because so, that's certainly limited access, and how does right. that access affect health? Right. So that was the big issue, and then fortunately, I think the Lexington as a community has so many different nonprofit organizations in the city, in the urban government, city and the county government who cares about that issue. So um, many organizations took my report and then developed the, the, the uh, uh, program. That, uh, many of them are like community garden where you teach younger children and the youth how to grow their own food and they cook them. Uh, she leaf did that uh, uh, successfully. And the food chain, which is located in the basement of the uh, West Six, they have their own uh, hydroponic system, which uh, uh, provide fresh vegetable, access to the fresh vegetable to uh, uh, various community members in the neighborhood. So I think that, yes, building the grocery store is one option, but that's not enough. It's about knowing where the food comes from, how to grow them, how to cook them, and se selecting the right uh, uh, food items. Those are the, the, the skills and the knowledges that we as uh, uh, universities and the community organization are committed to uh, um, uh, sh uh, share with our community members. 
And so speaking of sharing it with community members, you are quite published when it comes to this topic in many publications. Yep. Can you talk about that both in English and in Japanese, right? Right. So for the English, so there's a two type of actually publication that most of the professors write. One is for our peers, on peers that published peer review, and then only professors, and then even the people within that area read those items. But I also publish uh, uh, some technical reports and actually distributed them at the various community-based meetings. And in Japanese, I publish in a magazine which are actually distributed to the government agencies and beyond the um, uh, 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 academics. And then also I think that uh, people in the extension, you know, it, it's, not, it's not called cooperative extension, but it's kind of like uh, farmers cooperative agents who also have those uh, subscription to the, that kind of magazine. So that's the way to kind of distribute the, uh, my research finding to l larger public. Okay, so but that's not all that you have done. <laughs> you have also been the director of the Asian Center. Tell us about your work there. Yes, yeah, so the Asian Center was established with a series of grants. Uh, Freeman Foundation, uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Education's grant to um, basically build Asian studies curricula. And the first was a, was a Japan studies uh, program and the second was a China Studies program, and then also the, it was Asia Center who um, uh, competed to establish a, a fund from Chinese government to establish Confucius Institute, which got recently closed. Um, and then the amazing thing about Asia Center in that decade, I was a, um, uh, almost decade, I was a director, we brought school teachers, to be trained in teaching about Asia, and uh, also we work with undergraduate students. We sent undergraduate students various Chinese, uh, various Asian countries, um, and and we've hired several faculty members who specialize in Asian studies. So it was one of the golden moment uh, in my career, in, you know, career that that you know, I, I it was just incredible energy to create something new and then good for the state of Kentucky. So, I mean, I think University of Kentucky is the only university in the state of Kentucky which has both bachelor's degree, both in Japan studies and Chinese language and literature studies. So you're talking about energy. Yes. Let me tell you something that, I'm gonna read a quote that one of your students <laughs> said about you okay. and then hear what your thoughts are about okay. it. I love getting to learn sociology from Dr. T. She has high standards and clear expectations and was always super willing to explain and meet out of class time. She really cares about students' opportunities to learn and pushing them to be their best. Oh. How does that make you feel when one oh. of your former students... Oh, that's, that's nice to hear. I mean, a lot of people say I'm energetic. Um, but um, I would say yes. <laughs> yes, yes, and I can't contain myself <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but a good thing you know have to be really pushed so yeah okay but that's not all of the work that you have been doing you are very focused on Asian hate yes talk yeah. to us about that so um, I have been co-chair of Asian Asian American affinity group uh, at University of Kentucky which is a affinity group for employees, UK employees, that does not include actually students at all. And then Asian descent, the employees, UK employees of Asian descent are the largest minority group on campus. At the University yeah. of Kentucky? Yeah, okay. it's, it's a lot larger. And then um, it has been kind of a challenge because it's so big, right? How to create this coherent community, and I have not been very good about it, doing that. but. Unfortunate event in during the COVID. I mean, it's not just that what happened in Atlanta, but there has been series of anti-Asian hate crimes happening as actually Black Lives Matter movement was going on, and, and so 
there is a lot of kind of, I, I think this is really first time since I think civil war, uh, uh, civil rights movement, that many of the Asian Americans and, and uh, um, Asians, they began to see, okay, we got to speak up. We mm -hmm. need to speak up and say, enough is enough, right? It's, it's so, so called this minority, uh, uh, no, sorry, model minority, and then is not the story. It, it, it's it's kind of a facade, facade, and then it's not the reality of what kind of experience many of the Asian Americans feel. So it was not actually me who organized. It's the two brave Asian American Asian uh, a, a, a faculty member who organized the first UK campus protest, and then that also. I think affected within the community that some of the uh, leaders of Asian American organization began to say, we need to do something in Lexington. Mm -hmm. So I was a speaker for two events, one for the UK uh, campus rally, and then the second one was in Lexington. And there's a morning, <laughs> morning uh, rally and an afternoon one, and I was in the morning one. So you've been you've been very busy, but you've also done um, a piece with Asian hate and COVID nineteen a year of two pandemics. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, and I also moderated a panel discussion, virtual uh, panel discussion organized by Martin Luther King uh, Center at UK as well as Graduate School's uh, Diversity Office. And it was fabulous. I we never expected that many people to actually log in, mm -hmm. and then conversation we had was amazing, amazing to talk about, you know, the kind of uh, uh, struggles that Asian Americans, Asians and Asian Americans uh, experience, and what we need to do to address it. Well, and sometimes you can find solidarity in conversations yes. and yes. in groups. Yes. Yes. And that was, I think, the great thing about that that panel discussion, virtual panel discussion, that was organized, uh, because this idea that yeah, we have to build unity, coalition, wide and, and inclusive. And then I think that, that, that I hope, even after the COVID, this kind of commitment to the coalition building going to continue. Okay. So, but that's not all you do either. <laughs> you do are, I? talk to me about your, your love of music. Oh, oh yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, You yes. love music. I love music, mm -hmm. yes. So yes. tell me about some of the things that you do. So when I was in high school, I actually did play piano. But yeah. I, when I was a kid, but I quit because my hands are so small and I cannot really reach uh -huh. the Those certain fingers yeah, don't, yeah, the reach. The real, don't reach. And so when I was in um, high school, I switched to choir and then I love that. And then I oh, also you're did, a singer too. Yeah, I, I oh used to sing too. But then in at UK in the last oh I don't know when I started. I joined a uh, UK Balinese Gamelan Ensemble organized by Dr. Donna Kwan, which is actually open to, it, students can take it for credit, but it's mm. open to anyone. Anybody who is interested in learning, joining this incredibly unique music ensemble. Instruments are all percussion. And it's kind of like a playing xylophone and drums. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, the, there is no, it, 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 they are actually music uh, notes, but the notes are n nothing like Western uh, uh, music notes. And it's only one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, five, and the four and the five are the same because there's only four keys. And then it's repetitive playing this, uh, uh, the phrase repeatedly over and over in a, in 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 a, in a music. And well, you said to me off camera that it's very therapeutic and soothing. Yes, it is. It is very soothing because it's a repetition. So almost to the point, it become uh, how to say the meditation, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're doing exactly the same movement. 
and listening to the same sound over and over. Sometimes we play like same phrase for 16 times. And then soon enough, your body started to feel like, oh, this sounds so good and soothing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And banging the, the metal, <laughs> the metal key, key is really, uh, uh, yeah, release your stress. And then you were talking about something that's happening at the zoo. Yes. Okay. So we will be uh, performing at the fundraising events at Louisville Zoo. And I don't, I think it's not open to the public at all. It is for the donors. Yeah, so okay. we are excited about that. Dr. Donna Kwang is really great uh, instructor. So. Yes, she is a phenomenal woman. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she, is. she is. Okay, so before we go, I also heard that you are a white water rafting <laughs> expert. <laughs> Tell <laughs> <laughs> okay, so mm. I just did Are you one. an instructor? <laughs> no. Come on, give it to us. No, I, so I did, <laughs> over the summer, this, this just a couple of weeks ago, uh, my partner and I drove from Lexington all the way to Idaho and uh, Montana. And in Idaho, in Ketchum, um, uh, at the, we tried for the first time white water rafting. And then um, there was a guide, of course, a guide, and then two of us. And then this, the, the, the guide told us, warned us, they're going to be a couple very uh, uh, strong rapids, which is not the, cla- the, 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 the classification system, and it's only uh, second class. It's not very rapid, mm-hmm. and, but it's going to be a little bit of a bump. And so the first one, that, that when the, 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 uh, uh, um, the rafter went in, and it kind of like a bound. And then, then my whole body, I'm holding this bar in front, but my body kind of jumped, and it totally thrown off to the river. And then the moment it, I got it thrown in, and I'm like, Oh, I'm in the water. And then I noticed my glass is, is my sunglasses <laughs> off falling off from my, my face. And I said, I told myself, no, I can't let it go because this is prescription sunglasses, <laughs> graduated sunglasses, very expensive. I don't want to lose it. And then, then another brain says, keep the legs up, keep the feet up, keep the feet up. That's what the guy said. Whatever you do, if you get thrown out, please keep your uh, uh, legs up so that, that your legs won't be stuck in a, between the rocks and then, then your body will be washed and then, then you will ne- your body so you will never were, come up. You were trying to save your glasses and stay alive at the same time. Yeah. And that, meanwhile, I'm, calm, I'm so calm and I'm like, okay, keep my legs up. He's going to come get me. He's going to come <laughs> get me. So I'm not going to worry about this. And the whole oh, water is so comfortable. <laughs> yeah, it was, well, you, were, was you took that calm. like a champ because yes. I would have panicked. That's what I think. The glasses would have been gone. And yeah. probably so would I because yeah. I would have just panicked. Yeah. yeah. It has been so nice talking to you today. Thank you for letting us celebrate well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for inviting me. And, and I love working with the Community Action Council. And in fact, I send my students to volunteer, I think, just about every spring. So, well, yay. Yes, thank they, you so yes, much. In touch. But before we leave, mm-hmm. I want to give you the last word to young girls and women about pursuing their dreams. Any words that you might have for them? Yeah. So I came to the United States in 1985 because I knew if I stay in Japan, I'm just going to be wife and a mother. And then so it was for me to realize my dream, which is was to become professor. And then I think whatever people say to you, you got to believe in yourself and in your dream and then, then just, even if it's maybe difficult, but jump into it and you succeed. Thank you very much. Okay. You guys continue to join us as we celebrate other phenomenal women all across Kentucky who are doing great things in the community. I'll talk to you soon.